Casey's is a premier garden center and gift shop located in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Casey's offers a wide selection of plants, landscaping materials, home and garden decor, and gifts for every occasion. Casey's is committed to providing exceptional service, a unique shopping experience, and value to every customer. Stop in and see what makes Casey's so unique. Located at 21481 State Line Road, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, or call 812-537-3800. Let Casey's help you add beauty to your home. Welcome to Strong Dads. Hey, this is Burrell Hutchinson, and I'm bringing you another great show today, but without my partner, Kyle. Kyle is off on a little family vacation uh, prior to Easter here, and so he's off with his kiddos and wife, Jen, and they're out there uh, just hopefully enjoying their, their little spring break time and some little bit of family time. So anyway, that means you're stuck with me for Strong Dads today. But you know what? That's okay. So Kyle, just thanks a lot for leaving me hanging there. I'll just go ahead and do my own thing. And uh, you know, your mic's out here all by itself. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Leave me hanging. Anyway, having some fun there. Um, I got a lot to talk about today. This is an opportunity for me to talk about some of the processing that I have gone through as a man trying to grow uh, from even a young man into where I am at now and just the processing of how you come to the place that you you're coming to each day in terms of arriving with maturity and understanding um, our role as a strong dad and as a husband and even a follower of Christ like how do you come to that you know you weren't just born to understand that you, you have to actually walk through uh, your journey and so I want to um, uncover some of that and hopefully some of the insights that I share uh, will be things that help you uh, as is maybe part of when I share a certain time that I was in that you can connect because maybe you're in that time right now for yourself. Uh, maybe the situation with your family or, or your faith or your workplace or whatever. So I want to share a little bit of that and just how my brain processed and where it led me to. Okay. So anyway, before we get started with all that, I want to thank the Crimer's Beer House along with Casey's Outdoor Solutions for being a sponsor of Strong Dads and for all they do for us. So let me talk a little bit about, here's, here's what I'm calling today's show. I'm saying, why Jesus? So this is Holy Week, and for those of you guys out there listening, um, if you're a man of faith, you understand a little bit about Holy Week, as it's the week that led up to um, the crucifixion, and then later the resurrection, which we call Easter, Easter Sunday, of Jesus Christ. And so... I just kind of want to walk through some of um, the processing that I had to get to and through for me to understand why this Easter thing was even that important. Again, and I'm taking away the, all the Sunday school answers here, okay? Like, well, because Jesus rose and because he died and all of these things. Like, listen, I heard that stuff from the time I was a little kid. And, you know, when you just hear it, it doesn't mean you understand it. It doesn't mean that you're really connected with it. You just did it because that's what people did. So I want to walk through this and maybe hopefully shed some insight as to why you can dig or how you can dig deeper into your own understanding and your faith that uh, will hopefully help you in your walk. I remember being in college. One of the most frustrating times that I had was when I was in college because I went for over two years, probably closer to three years, is that wonderful thing called an undecided. You know what an undecided is? An undecided major, meaning I didn't really quite know why I was there, what I was doing, what I was going to do with it. And I just knew it was costing me a lot of time, a lot of stress of studying and taking tests and doing all the work involved. And it was taking money. And I had to pay every dime of my college education. So for me, I had to go to work. Um, I went, I drove to a commuter school, um, would go to class all day, and then I would come back in the afternoon or evening, and I would work at a grocery store. And so whatever money I made paid for gas, uh, food, and tuition. And even with that, I came out with some debt, but it wasn't nearly like today's debt that you see students coming out with. But it was really hard because 
When you're in the middle of not knowing why you're doing something, you start to question, what on earth is this about? And so I remember that. It was that here's the whole deal. Like, I didn't have meaning because I didn't have purpose. And what was so interesting about that is how, um, like, my grades reflected it completely. My grades were in the tank. So I was always an average student to begin with, so I'm not going to try to, like, you know, um, talk as if I'm something I'm not. I was an average student, didn't really care much for the study thing. Um, I was more uh, hands-on, wanted to be active and interactive in that way, and the whole idea of reading books was just, it wasn't like I didn't, I couldn't do it. It was just, actually, I would just fall asleep when I did it. I mean, literally, like, when I read, um, I fall asleep. And so it was brutal for me to just try to read everything that I had to read and just fight through each day. Here's the bottom line. You should have seen my grades. My grades were, you know, um, a C's average, right? And so my goal was just to at least be average. And so I, my typical grade point average um, early in college was like 2.4, 2.6, maybe a 2.8. That'd be a great quarter or semester there. And it was all just like I had no idea what I was doing. And so as I was walking through that process of just checking the boxes of education, the frustration was growing. I didn't know my purpose. And I, I, I really was ready to quit. And I took these interest inventories, personality surveys, all these different things that you take, and all of them kept indicating that I should, I, I had kind of a talent or a knack for um, interaction with others, uh, for teaching, coaching, sales, stuff like that. And I just kept saying no to it. I kept saying no, especially teaching. I was like, because here was the message. The message was, don't be a teacher. They don't make any money. All my buddies were going out, and, and they were smarter in, in math than I was, and they were all going into engineering because that's where the money was. And I didn't have the grades or the, the math gumption behind me to do the engineering thing. So I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm certainly not going to be a teacher. So I fought that. I fought that for two solid years. And in the meantime, was just miserable. And everything about it was miserable, my grades and just having to work and everything. Finally, um, I had a little bit of a coaching experience where I got to work with some younger kids in the world of swimming. And I thought, well, you know, that was kind of cool. Like, I, I really enjoyed that. That was fun. It was a good time. And I, I kind of had a knack for it. And so I went back. This was actually my uh, start of my junior year, okay? My junior year, I went back and I signed up for an education class. Up to that point, I was basically a biology major, a science major. Um, because I knew I just had a general interest in the sciences. And so I um, took an education class. And I got to um, sit in on a class, basically shadow another teacher. And I shadowed the teacher for about a week or so, maybe a little less than that. And, you know, honestly, I was kind of bored to death as I just sat there for the day and watched him teach. And so he came up to me and he said, so how's it going? I'm like, well, you know, it's okay. It's all right. He's like, well, what would you like to do? I'm like, well, I, I don't know. Like, I'd like to at least try my hand at teaching just to see if I liked it or if I was any good at it. And he's like, well, how about on Monday, you go ahead and take all my general biology classes. And that was three classes. Why don't you take all my general biology classes? And I was like, let's do it. Let's go. Like, let's jump on. Let's give it a shot. And so that Monday I came in and I picked up all three of his general biology classes. And at the end of that week, I fell in love. I was like, now that is cool. I was running the class. I was preparing the lessons. I was just interacting. I mean, it was me kind of being in charge and having to have direction and what I was doing each day. And that experience right there was what moved me into the whole idea that I could actually teach for a living. See, here's why this is imp important. I told you I went through two years of not having purpose, and I struggled and fought every day through that. And just through that experience of finally putting the messaging of the world, which the messaging of the world was, you know, you don't want to be a teacher. They don't make any money. You don't want to work in a school. 
you know, um, teachers are for those who can't do and all these comments that I used to get all the time or hear other people. And all of a sudden I actually got a chance to do that. And it was a big wow for me. Here's what was really cool. That was the first part of the first semester of my junior year. Okay. You can look at my transcripts today. I still have my transcripts. You can look at my transcripts. And from that time, I went from the, remember those grade point averages of 2.2 and 2.4? I went to 3.4, 3.8, 3.6, nothing but A's and B's, whereas before it was all I could do to, to just get a C, all right? What happened? There was no change in intellect. There was nothing deeper about me. I finally had purpose. Now, why is this important? Guys, when we flounder around, when we find ourselves in a state of just confusion, sometimes we call it depression, sometimes we call it lack of motivation. Usually, really, if you boil it down, you find that there's somewhere there's a lack of purpose and meaning in what we're doing. And if we don't figure that out, we are going to continue to be stuck there. So I share that just for the reason of what I want to move into today. You see... My question today is why Jesus? Why Jesus as we come in, uh, as we are celebrating here this Easter weekend coming up, why Jesus? I had the same kind of experience, the same feeling, the lack of purpose, the lack of meaning in my faith walk. A lot of the same sort of um, confusions, lack of direction. And, and I have to tell you, like, th- this, is, this is on me, all right? This is on me because I grew up in a Catholic home went to church every Sunday, me and my brothers and sisters, mom and dad, so nice family unit all together going to church every Sunday. And I will tell you, we did not miss a Sunday. Uh, even on weekends that we would go camping or be out of town, my parents always found a church and we always went to mass, okay? But all of a sudden I started to get to a point where I was questioning it as a high schooler, like, why do we even do this? And I think a lot of it had to do with... <laughs> Just how I, I, in my mind, now I'm not here to argue Catholicism or not, okay? It was in my mind, I just saw contradiction or confusion, which added to my lack of meaning and purpose in the faith. Um, Changing the rules on eating meat on Friday seemed really weird to me. Like the idea that you could get a dispensation if you were in a certain community or parish, and the priest or bishop said, you know what, because we got this going on this week, we're going to go ahead and let you folks uh, eat the meat on Friday rather than the fish and I was like really like he can actually do that because last week uh, it was a sin and this week he can actually create an opportunity for me to not sin huh that's weird but again not much thought in that other than it was confusing and then I had a situation where my parents uh, after 35 years or close to 35 years of marriage Um, there was a break in the marriage, um, and through multiple rounds of counseling and trying to pull them back together, it finally ended in divorce. And with that divorce, um, my mom sought to get an annulment through the church. And at that time, me and my siblings, we were grown, we were out of the house, but we were still pretty young. We were in our uh, mid twenties or so. And I was very angry and frustrated with that process because, uh, one, she was getting the runaround. One priest would say, hey, don't really worry about it. Another priest would say, well, you really have to do it, and here's how you have to do it. And then it it was costing several thousand dollars um, if she wanted to pursue that. And I'm I'm just telling you, this was our experience. I'm not here to argue whether the process is what it is. I'm just saying this was our personal experience. But I just got angry with it, and there were some statements that were made there that were like, well, the annulment was for the idea to say that you should have actually, or you were actually never married. That was, that really made me mad, because, you know, we had, for many, many, many years, we had a great family, and the marriage was even good, okay, but the last five marriage years of that marriage, uh, it really brought out some weaknesses, and again, without going into the details of that, it took the life of that marriage. But to look at us kids and say that our parents were never married, really, I struggled with that. Again, I didn't understand meaning. I didn't understand purpose in that. So I became angry. 
anyway, I move on to, from that, and I talk about the idea of I was really done with the Catholic Church. In fact, I was kind of done with my faith in a lot of levels. Like, I don't, I don't even know really what all that means. And I started to boil it down to simple things like this. Well, I believe in a superior being. I believe like, okay, I'll call it a God, I'll call it whatever, but I, I do believe in a superior being because all of this is pretty complicated out here in, in nature. And I really, no one's been able to explain it very well or thoroughly at all, even in the science world. And so that's not even close to being able to explain it, the intricacies of it, the complexity of it. So I was like, okay, yeah, there's definitely something greater out there. But I don't know whether it's called God or whatever. I'll just call it a superior being. And that's really where I was for a while. And then we had kids. And um, my wife, Linda, who you guys, we talk about all the time and on Strong Dads, she had a strong conviction in the tradition of church, as well as that's what I was brought up in, too. And she was really struggling with me not desiring to go to church anymore. We have kids. Like, this is what we have to do. We have to get them to church. Like, they need to be baptized as infants and things like that. And I was starting to kick. I was starting to say, I don't know. Like, I... You can take them. I something. It doesn't feel right. Like there's there's something wrong here. And it got to that point where I finally said, "Listen, I don't. I, I'm not able to go there with a good heart. Uh, like I'm I'm full of a lot of confusion when I go, and I'm second guessing everything. And uh, as it would turn out, and I've shared some of this story before. Linda and I have both shared some of this." Um, we had a new neighbor that moved in right across the street from us. And Linda and I, it was a Saturday morning, we woke up um, and we got into an argument. We got into an argument about, well, what are we going to do for church tomorrow on Sunday? And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going. Like, I I'm, I don't get it anymore I, I'm, with the things that I grew up with, with the things with my parents. I still had some of that uh, resentment in me. And I said, you know, I'm not going. And, and she was very upset. And I, so I said, I'm going out for a run. That's my way of avoiding things, as some of you know that I like to avoid. And um, so I went out for a run. And I went out for a run, and I came back, and right across the street was a brand-new neighbor. And the new neighbor came out, he was getting his newspaper, and so I was finishing up my run, and I saw him, and I would just walk right over to his driveway, and I just introduced myself and shook his hand. And we started very simply, like, well, you know, what are you doing, blah, blah, And I just jokingly said, well, other than starting the day with an argument with my wife, I'm doing fine, or whatever, and, and we kind of just joked about it, not a big deal. And I said, yeah, we're just arguing about church. And, you know, I, I mean had no intention of doing anything with that statement other than I just gave a little explanation as to why we might have been arguing. And he's like, oh, church. He's like, well, we're trying to figure out where to go to church, you know, being new and everything. And we're going to try this new church or this church that's new to us um, up in town, up in the town of Bright, actually, Indiana. Uh, you're welcome to join us, like, if you want to join us, because we don't know what we're doing either. And at that time, Linda had walked out, and she— um, saw us talking, and she's, um, I told her a little bit of what we are talking about, and he invited us again, and I said, well, what do you think, hon? What do you, what do you think about maybe trying that church out? And she's like, hon, I'm, I'm game. I'll try it out. So we went ahead, and that next Sunday, we went to a church that was a non-denominational church, Bright Christian Church was the name of that church, is still the name of that church, um, and it was like an experience I had never had in a church setting. The preacher was talking about God's Word. He was had a Bible open, and he was preaching. Uh, I can't tell you the actual content, but I could. I just was amazed at the attentiveness of everybody in the church. Now, maybe that was just my mind, right? Like, I'm not going to sit there and tell you that people weren't daydreaming. I mean, I don't know, but it seemed like everybody was engaged at a level that I wasn't used to seeing where I used to go to church. And people were singing at a level that I had never seen where I went to church. And then the preacher was explaining things about the word that I had never had explained to me. And I actually started to get a little bit angry. When I walked out of there, I was like, 
I have heard that passage or that message so many times, but I've never heard it explained like that. I've never, it never had any meaning to me. And that term meaning started to mean something so much different to me. I walked out of there feeling like somebody was talking directly to me, like the preacher was just (laughs) looking at me right in the eyes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I should hide right now. I'm convicted. And so I walked out of there and Linda and I were talking on the drive home. I said, well, what do you think? She's like, wow, that was powerful. Wow. She and I both agreed on a message that we had never heard together mean what it meant today. So we decided we were going to go back again the following Sunday, and we did. Long story short, we never stopped going back. Here's some things, guys, that started that process. The lack of meaning. The lack of purpose. Why are those important? Well, without meaning and purpose, you just can only do certain things for so long. Okay, like if that's like you remember the movie Holes and the kids when they were in trouble, they were out in the desert and because they were in trouble, they just had to dig holes. Why were they digging holes? Oh, for no particular reason. It was just to keep them busy. And eventually you just really lose heart. Like, you mean, am I digging for water or am I just digging a hole? Well, you're just digging a hole. We're going to fill it up here in a little bit and then you'll redig it again. And, and when you operate that way, you just lose all meaning and purpose to keep doing it. And that's kind of where I was with my faith. And that was part of the journey then that I think I had to go through for me to start to dig deeper. And I share that with you because if you're lacking meaning and purpose, then don't just keep doing what you're doing. Seek the meaning. Seek the purpose. Dig in deeper, okay? It's okay to question. It is okay to question. As long as you don't leave it there just at the questioning, you got to start searching for the answers, okay? So let me just progress a little farther because my title here today for my little talk is Why Jesus? So I started to move through this, and I did something I had never done. I attended a Bible study with a group of men, And listen, I was totally green. We didn't even own a Bible, okay? So I was totally green. I'm 32, 33 years old at this point. Never owned a Bible in my uh, adult life. And I remember, oh, as a kid, we had a Bible. It was a green Bible. It sat on a shelf. We never even opened it. I, I don't even know what version it was, okay? But it was this green Bible, okay? And, um... So now I'm in a Bible study, and I'm, I, I kind of have that science mind, like, show me, prove it to me. You know, that's what was my science teaching kind of background, like, you got to prove it. And so I was full of probably what came off as being arrogant questions. <laughs> like, well, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Well, I don't know if I believe in that. And these guys were really good with me. They were just like, no, no such thing as a dumb question. <laughs> and they would just keep handling me in a very respectful way. And they would answer my questions. And sometimes when they couldn't answer it well or didn't satisfy me, I'd be like, well, you know, whatever. Like, let's move on. And we are at a point where we had a, a conversation And uh, the question was, um, do you think you're going to heaven when you die? That was the question within our small men's group Bible study. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I I I don't know. Like, it depends. And the guy right next to me who was an associate pastor at the church that we were going to, without skipping a beat, without even delaying, he just said, well, sure, I'm going to heaven. Like, duh. (laughs) I mean, he was really like, almost in my mind, that pompous. It sounded pompous to me. It sounded arrogant. And so I caught him out. I said, how arrogant are you? Wow, you're just going to heaven? And he was like, well, yeah, I'm going to heaven. And I was blown away, and I said, how can you even say that? And he, and he's, he just looked at me, and he said, um, well, you know, because I believe in Jesus, and I believe the promises that he gives me. And so as long as I believe in him, and, and I believe the promises, and I follow him, I'm going to heaven. He promised that. 
and I still couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. My, my idea of going to heaven at that point in time was, well, it depends on if I die on a day that I'm being good. <laughs> so I hope, I hope I'm doing good on the day I get struck by lightning because then maybe I have a chance. If I'm not doing good that day, then all oh, bets are off, okay? So it was so dependent on my behavior, on my actions. That's how I was wired. I think that's really how I was uh, uh, just believing for so many years that I didn't even think twice about it. It was really like, well, you know, maybe today, today's a good day if I got to go. They called me out on that in a loving way. Like, no, nah, nah, that's not really what this is about. This is not about what you do. This is about what he did. And that completely confused me. I just have to be honest with you. Like coming from my background, I'm 32 years old. Like that was foreign to me. And now I'm, I'm confused again because what I thought I knew all this time, now I'm just more confused and I'm beginning to wonder like, what do you mean? So guys, this kind of led me, so not just digging in with faith, like it started me having a confusion about Jesus. So even up to this point, I was still okay with saying there was a superior being. There was a God's figure out there. But I still wasn't quite like, yeah, Jesus was just this good teacher guy. But like, I didn't really understand like saving power of, or even like to be saved. That was something that the Holy Roller said. Are you saved? You know, were you born again? Honestly, like that was weird stuff to me. And I'm not stepping on any toes because I get it completely. That was just weird. Like that's not how we talked in our house. And so I, I started on the quest to try to figure out what this whole Jesus thing was about. All right. And from a science perspective, Science is really good at looking at the physical world and trying to reveal God's work, All right? Science doesn't prove anything other than it reveals. It reveals the intricacies, the complications. It's like, you know, looking more deeply into something and seeing how it's made. It's a reverse engineering kind of thing. You're like something's already made and then you break it open. You go, oh, okay, this is how it's made. Oh, now we have this discovery. But it didn't make it. Science doesn't make anything. It just reveals it. And so you have to be really careful. And scientists, and I am, and by my nature, I'm one of those kind of people. I like to break things apart and say, how, does, how did that get put together, okay? But don't be fooled for a second to think that scientists are putting things together. Scientists are just seeing how things are put together, okay? And so science needs to keep doing what it does. I mean, I'm all for science and about it. Like, yeah, we need, because this is really cool stuff to see how things do work so that we can interact with it even better. But here's where science falls short. Science is good for the physical world, right? But it doesn't even scratch the surface. Be, listen to me, guys. It does not even scratch the surface to understanding the complexities of any part of creation, whether it's on this earth, this world, uh, universe, anything. Like even at the cell level, we can't even figure out the, the smallest parts of cell behavior and function and structure, okay? So there's craziness going on. Now we get a little better, but I will tell you, it'll never be complete. We'll never know how things actually work to their fullest, all right? It's just a continued revelation, but we're, we're, we're just in the infancy, okay? But here's something that's even crazier. There's these things called humans, and this is what got me to thinking about Jesus, all right? I hope you guys are bearing with me, okay? This is what got me to Jesus. So why do I need to go past this superior being and go to the idea of why Jesus? Remember I talked about I have to have meaning and purpose for me to really dig in and start to understand why I'm going to pursue something. And so science was good at trying to help me wrap my head around things like creation and stuff like that. But it didn't explain some things about human behavior. And sometimes they talk about the social sciences and the soft sciences, and, and they really are that. They're just soft. Like a lot of it's guesswork. We don't even know, okay? And we start, I, I want to back up for a second to see like, okay, and you've maybe heard me say some of this in shows before. In God's nature, like in his physical world, things behave the way they do because 
God has set them into motion. All right, they, the, the laws of gravity, um, how things grow, how things die, how things change, how seasons come and go, how planets spin, like all of that happens and it's very systemically and predictable. It, it happens in a certain way once you start to understand these laws, what we call these laws of nature, okay? And it's really interesting, like I've, you've heard me say before, like, the, the planets don't like argue with God. No, I'm sick of going in this circle around this sun. Like this is ridiculous. I'm tired. I want a new path. The trees don't you sit there and whine and complain about uh, whether they get to drop their leaves today or tomorrow or why they have to drop their leaves, period. Like they just do it. All right. I, sometimes if you could ever uh, look at it like a bee's um, a bee's um, nest or, or um, uh, ant's hill or anything like that, and just see everything just seems to be working. Like everything seems to have its place. Certain bees doing certain jobs and functions and like, you know, they, they don't hold strikes. Um, they don't do boycotts or walk out. They just seem to do it, all right? And then you have humans. And so something different has to happen with humans that scientists can't really wrap their head around because everything still is going to operate under God's nature, whether you like it or not, all right? But now we have to understand human nature, and this is where Jesus comes in. You see, Jesus starts to reveal things about how we are to operate if we're going to operate in God's nature, but as a human See, here's what happens that's really crazy for us. And God created an under, or a concept of love. And love is really the thing. Love is the thing that drives this whole change in human behavior versus other organisms, okay? Love can only happen when you have a choice. You can't make someone love you. Somebody has to have the desire of the heart to actually care for and sacrifice and tend to the need of another person when it is set upon them to desire that. You can't make them do that, all right? And so love is weird because it's choice. And that's that we talk about free will. And that free will, like as a human we are the only organism, guys, just think about this. You're the only organism from trees and plants of all sorts and, and, and other bugs and animals. You're the only organism that can deny God's nature. You can basically flip him off. You can basically say, I don't care. I'm not doing it your way. I'm doing it my way. Now think about that. We've been given an intellect that's power enough to do a lot of problem solving and a lot of figuring out our own way. But we're also able to have enough intellect to confuse ourselves and to think that our way is the way. And now we start to get into a dangerous zone. And this is why Jesus comes in and he starts to talk and say crazy things, crazy things that don't make sense to us, okay? Like Jesus makes a comment, then this was one that grabbed me early on. I mean, I wrestled with this. John 14, 6. In John 14, 6, Jesus makes a claim and he says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Man, I, I had to wrap my head around that. This was confusing again. And I'm, I'm seeking meaning and purpose. Like, I'm not going to do stuff unless I know why, you know, what it's going to get me. And so when I'm reading something like this, I'm going, What? And then you go back to the work of C.S. Lewis, and there were other people before C.S. Lewis. I think it's called the Trilemma, which came up long before, but C.S. Lewis put it in his own words. I want to read C.S. Lewis's work because, again, I'm looking for meaning and purpose so that I know why Jesus, all right? And it says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the, the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept him his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. 
you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was God. That's from his work in Mere Christianity. And th- that was an eye-opening thing for me. Like, wait, like if I'm going to buy the concept of Jesus, even a little bit, then I have to really like, okay, if Jesus actually lived then did he do what he actually said he did? And then I have to start like understanding that. Like, what does that mean? Guys, as we talk about Jesus, I'm just going to challenge you. If you're looking for meaning and purpose, especially as a man, and I'm trying to figure out in this crazy world as we've got conservative conservativism and progressivism and all of these isms that are trying to tell me how to be as a person, I'm going to challenge you first to go to an authority that explains God's nature better than any science book ever would. That's what the role of Christ was. He was man, but in God form. He knows the nature of God. God is within him. And so listen to his words. His words are crazy. I mean, his words don't make sense to us on a human nature form. But that's what I challenge you to do. That's that's the great dig in. And so you've heard me talk about before. This Easter, start reading the letters of red in the Bible, okay, the scriptures, uh, the, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start reading the letters of, of, that are in red. Those are the words of God, of Jesus, and just start to wrestle with them, right? Just like, like I've been trying to do, like, like you, like wrestle with them. And then when you find yourself wanting to argue with Jesus, stop and think about for a second who you are and who he claims to be. When you stop and think about who you are and all of your limited skill and ability and who he is, I think it becomes a whole different conversation, one in which you become quiet and you listen to him. That's what it has been for me. It's what it continues to be for me. And so when we talk about the idea of why Jesus Because Jesus is the one who reveals God to us. Just as science reveals so much of the physical creation of the universe, and and science needs to keep doing that, Jesus reveals the God nature of the human experience. And when we do things God's way, whether it's in family, whether it's with our own personal body, whether it's how we interact and do marriage and family, doing it God's way through how it was revealed through Jesus Christ is life-changing. It is life-changing. Remember my transcripts went from C's to A's? That's what happens when you start to look and see, wow, this is why Jesus should be listened to. All right, and then he goes on, and, and again, I mean, the resurrection, all right? I would ask you, study the resurrection. Like, why did a price have to be paid? Understand the expense that it took to do that. You know, why was a human life a sacrifice, an animal life? Why, why were those actually used to pay debt, all right? Well, anim- animals, you know, at the time, those were a currency. If you owned animals, you had wealth. So you would pay your, your debt through those animals. And so that was part of the culture. And so that was a language that was very common. And so then when we talk about the idea of, you, of blood being shed or sacrificed to pay a debt, And then we talk about what sin is, and sin is us denying God's nature and taking on our nature. So sin is not whether you got a potty mouth or, 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 you know, you watched a bad TV show. Sin is when you deny or turn away from God's nature, how he desires things to go. And you're the only organism that can do it. 
You're the only organism that can turn away and choose your nature, your way, and we call that selfishness. And so the debt to be paid to help cover that is where Christ comes in, all right? So anyway, I'm just, I, I hope I didn't lose you in this. This is a process of thinking and, and just, you know, I, I'm a work in progress just like you guys are, but I challenge you to wrestle these things. I challenge you to take them to people who are smarter than you and I and to say, hey, help me with this. You know, I, I, there are people that I go to like, you know what, I'm really wrestling with this one. Help me out. Show me what you think here. All right. And to dig into that word and try to get greater understanding of the ultimate gift that was given to us through Christ. So happy Easter to all of you guys. Uh, we want to thank all of you that support and continue to come alongside Strong Dads. If there's anything that I can do uh, to, to help you in a marriage, a parenting, or just a personal situation, reach out at rocksolidfamilies.org. We want to thank our sponsors of Casey's Outdoor Solutions and Crimer's Beer House for coming alongside of us. So guys, go out there and be a strong dad. Happy Easter. Hey, this is Kyle Carver from Strong Dads. Strong Dads podcast would love to thank the Crimer's Beer House for coming alongside of us. The Crimer's Beer House was started in 1982 by the Crimer family, and since that time, they have definitely become a Cincinnati favorite. So if you're looking for an incredible meal in an incredible setting, definitely go down to Route 128 and check out the Crimer's Beer House.